football. football. The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. Wow! What a weekend! Yeah, the weather was great too, but how they honored Daryl Green and how he presented himself and how everybody was able to honor him long after it was overdue was wonderful. The game yesterday was a blowout against Carolina. Yes, there is big concern about Jaden Daniels, but I think what we found out is that this offense is pretty darn good. You'd like to have number five pull in the trigger, but with number 18, you can score points. And yes, Carolina is an embarrassment. They're horrible. They're like what Washington has been many years over the last 25 years. But still, it's a professional football team, and you scored 40 points on them. You had a pick six in that game. You dominated on the ground. Um, There's a lot to feel good about this team. Yes, there is concern about Jaden Daniels, but, and I'm not a doctor, but when he came out on the field after being x-rayed in the locker room and got to see the offense score a touchdown, He raised his arms above his head, seemingly without pain. Now, it's possible he got a painkiller, but I don't think it's a broken rib. I don't know, and we didn't get any information from Dan Quinn after the game. He's supposed to tell us more in a news conference later today, but that didn't look like a guy who's got broken ribs. And I thought about the irony of this. It was the day that they honored Daryl Green, and I went through all of his – signature plays last week. I think three really stand out. Uh, Chasing down Tony Dorsett in his first game in 1983. The punt return against the Bears in the playoffs in 1988, followed by the following week where he knocked the ball away from Darren Nelson at the goal line. And in that Chicago game where he hurdled Cap Boso to return the punt, he tore a rib cartilage, and you see him as he's running into the end zone. He's got the football in one hand, and he's grabbing his rib with the other. And you saw some of that from Jaden Daniels on the field yesterday. Now, it, it did appear that his happened on a hit, and uh, as John Kime has it on ESPN today, he writes, um, uh, at the end of the 46-yard run, which I think it was the first play from scrimmage uh, for Washington yesterday, Uh, At the end of the run, Daniels turned slightly to his left to stiff-arm Panther safety Lonnie Johnson. Linebacker Marcus Haynes helped tackle Daniels from behind as well. After the next play, handoff to Austin Eckler, Daniels appeared to grab his left side as he carried out a fake run to the left. And if the rib injury is similar, and I'll go into more detail on this a little bit later on, but uh, as Daryl told me years later, uh, he did not want to play the following week thought he was in too much pain didn't think he would be able to play in the championship game against minnesota the game that was played at rfk because the vikings had upset the 49ers in san francisco and uh, he didn't think he was going to go and richie pettibone who had played safety in the nfl in the 60s and the 70s where if you could walk you took a shot and you played and he he told daryl that he expected him to take a shot and, and go into the game, and Gerald said, no, nah, it's my fifth year in the league. I've never taken an injection. I'm not going to do it now. And finally, uh, he came around and said, okay, I'll, I'll take the uh, injection. And he said it actually wore off in the first quarter. And so when he knocked the ball away from Darren Nelson on fourth and goal at the end of the game, he was obviously paying, playing in a lot of pain. And uh, I don't know what will happen with Jaden Daniels. This is generations later. We're talking, what, almost 40 years later. Uh, So things have changed. Protocol has changed. And, you know, years ago, um, you might have had a situation where the quarterback gets hurt like that and he takes a shot and he goes right back in the game. Uh, They're not going to risk any long term future with Jaden Daniels. You can be sure of that. So they kept him out the rest of the game. And with the way the game was going, it was obviously the smart thing. My God, it was 27 to nothing at halftime. By the way. The last time the Commanders had a game with that score or were they up by that margin or more at the half was a game that they played in 2005 against San Francisco. And Alex Smith, rookie Alex Smith, was the quarterback for the 49ers. 
And uh, I think it was either Pizza Hut or one of the other pizza chains, Papa John's maybe, uh, they had a promotion that they gave you a free topping for every touchdown the Redskins scored. And if they won the game, they would double the toppings. Well, they scored seven touchdowns in that game, and people were going into the, the chain and saying, I, I want my 14 toppings. And they said, we can't cook a pizza with 14 toppings. So that's how ridiculous it was. But, uh, yeah, it was a game that there was no need for him to come back into. And the way they ran the ball with over 200 yards, they had Brian Robinson back. He had 71 yards and a touchdown. There was no reason uh, to play him. So uh, all's well that ended well yesterday at uh, at I was going to say FedEx Field at Northwest Stadium. And uh, now the question is, are we going to have this dream quarterback matchup that everybody wants to see? Caleb Williams, number one, number one, grew up in the area, played at Gonzaga. Uh, He's the Bears quarterback and after kind of a rocky start has been playing very well lately. And Jaden Daniels right now on track to be rookie of the year. So we would see them go head to head. Uh, Is that going to happen? We don't know yet. This was uh, Dan Quinn after the game last night. I cannot give you an update on Jaden, um, but I will just as soon as we find out. We'll do some further tests tomorrow, John, and then when we get together in the afternoon, we'll give you an update. But I don't have anything for everybody else asking the same thing, same answer. So uh, just wanted to make sure I was super clear on that. When did you realize he was hurt? Uh, after the first drive. And so maybe at the end of the first drive, you know, right when we're down by the goal line, John. But uh, it was into that space. Uh, throw, testing, tent, then to go inside. So um, that's when I knew. And I'll give you some updates just as soon as I find out tomorrow, but I, I do not have any tonight. Do you know if it was on that 46-yard I don't. Okay. I don't, but I do know it happened during that drive at some yeah. point, Nikki. How do you think Marcus Mariota did step again? You know what? I was, uh, I'm really proud of Marcus, and uh, it's been a tough start to it, you know, IR and getting an injury. And so for him uh, to come back and, uh, you know, like see that kind of poise, uh, in the game, there was no flinch, and uh, this happened early, you know, after the very first drive for the offense for him to go in and go. And I look back to see post-practice who's out on the field working, he and other guys going through the script. And so, you know, I tip my hat to he and to Vita and Dave Blau and others that are spending the extra time. So if your moment gets called, that you're ready to deliver for the team. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Um, and he was able to do that tonight. Yeah, kind of ironically, uh, as, he, as he kind of brushed over it, but that's an important point. Uh, Marcus Mariota spent the first four games of the year on IR. Uh, his first game back was the Laffer against Cleveland, where he got to play in the fourth quarter with the game out of hand. Uh, had he uh, had this injury, I should say, uh, happen in the first four games, I don't know. You, you don't know uh, necessarily what, although Jeff Driscoll has looked good at times. He's a veteran, and against this team, I'm sure he would have won the game, but I don't know if we would have had a laugher like that. So we don't know. Um, there was this tweet that came out from Jaden Daniels' mom. For whatever, whatever it's worth, uh, she put out, he's fine, uh, after uh, ESPN reported the uh, initial x-rays were negative that uh, there there's no fracture it doesn't mean he's he's definitely going to be able to play this upcoming week but that is that is good news and yeah what the hell a good sign from mom as well uh, as for Mariota and this is this is the luxury of having salary cap room number 1 and a rookie quarterback uh, who doesn't eat up a lot of salary cap room you know top top of the line quarterbacks now are making Sixty million dollars or close to it. Mariota uh, is making about ten as a backup. Uh, he might not be able to go to one of those teams. Uh, they may not be able to afford a backup like that. But here, uh, you've got Jaden Daniels on a rookie deal, so it makes sense to pay him. I, I believe it's ten million dollars, and uh, a guy who has performed well in the past. And he, like Daniels, was the number two pick of the draft, was a starter right away out of college, and has some ups and downs in his career, but everything he said since coming here and everything you've heard from Jaden Daniels, he's the perfect guy to be the backup to Daniels. And when his moment came yesterday, he was more than ready. We have an, we have an unbelievable group of players that we talk about all the time. We have a brotherhood here and it's, um, it's very unique. Something that is very different from other teams that I've been on. Um, and just that kind of belief in each other, uh, really settled me down and, from there, just went out there and played. The, the offense, without Jaden, you stepped in. It seemed to just keep going uh, well. How uh, 
How did you kind of feel about the, the game plan today and what ultimately was this working for you guys? Cliff and the crew did an unbelievable job. Um, you know, they, they put us in really good spots to go out there and make plays and execute. Um, guys did a great job of getting open and finding ways to, uh, to get, get yards. Um, you know, you always feel that you leave a little out there, but I thought our guys did a great job kind of all day of executing. Comforting uh, with all the prep that you guys have done with Cliff to be able to come in there and take the reins really without flinching. Yeah, and it's really the entire staff. Um, you know, Tavita, uh, Coach Blau. It's funny I call him Coach Blau, but he's younger than me. Um, but it's, it's like I said, it's an unbelievable group of guys that um, day in and day out, we're always just trying to find ways to get better. And when you have that type of atmosphere, um, you know, you feel very confident when you go into a game, and um, that was no different for me. Yeah, and look, uh, he's not as fast as Daniels, obviously. Uh, probably at this stage of the game, uh, doesn't have the physical tools uh, that Daniels has, but uh, he is a runner as well, and that's why, he's, as he says, there was really no change in the game plan when he came in. Really, when it comes down to it, it's just trying to execute what, what the game plan was, and nothing for us really changed. And... Um, What's, what's very interesting for me is kind of day-to-day during the week, um, we as a quarterback group are talking about situations and scenarios all the time. So whether, regardless if it's me, if it's Jay, if it's Jeff, or even Sam, like we all kind of have an idea of what this is supposed to look like. So when we can just step in, um, we understand what the plan is, and we can just go play. And Terry McLaurin uh, talked after the game about uh, how the backups always take mental reps while the starter is playing. They keep talking about the quarterback room. I mean, it's it almost sounds too good to be true for a franchise that's been a dumpster fire for decades, but they've gotten it right in a short period of time. And I think if you step back, you might say that, that Marcus Mariota, if you had your pick of all the backup quarterbacks in the NFL – He's the one you'd want to have. And you got a wide receiver who's been there, done that. I mean, Terry McLaurin, since he's been here in 2019, I believe this is the 12th different quarterback that he has played with. Now, now Mariota technically was not the starter yesterday, though he came in after only one series. So uh, if anybody's ready for this, it's good old Terry McLaurin. I'm not going to like speculate on his injury, but he's a tough guy, and I know he's going to do whatever it takes to try to be ready for next week. So... Um, shout out to Marcus for coming in and being ready. Um, I'd expect nothing else of him. He's been a leader since he got here. Um, he's really helped Jaden along, and uh, we've really built some com- camaraderie with him as well. So um, I think my favorite part of the game was us to go down and, and score in a two-minute drive. When you don't have your starting quarterback, but you still uh, execute at a high level, um, I think that's a standard that we're setting for our offense, no matter who's in there. Uh, the expectation and the uh, production doesn't drop. So. Uh, I'm happy to see that he came in here and did what he did, but I didn't expect anything different. And he glossed over that two-minute drive, and they didn't need that touchdown, but it's a mindset that this team has that did not exist over the man who was known as Riverboat Ron. Uh, Ron Rivera would tend to sit on the ball at the end of the half, and this team marched down the field. I believe they got it at the eight-yard line, and the 12-yard pass to Zach Ertz with 10 seconds to go uh, really, well, the game was already out of reach at that point, but it made it 27 to nothing. And that's another really good sign that they don't take their foot off the gas and good for them. The hell with Carolina being a terrible team. That's fine. Uh, that, you know, that's that's their problem. But uh, I really like that aggressiveness, and they really did a good job with that. And Ertz, who caught the touchdown pass, which, uh, by the way, is uh, he did catch a two-point conversion earlier this year, but this is his first touchdown catch as a commander. That was good. And he also noted this. This is a guy now who's been around the league for a long time. Played in a good organization in Philadelphia. They won a Super Bowl there, okay? Uh, and he also played in Arizona. You can debate whether that's a good organization or not. But he's got some perspective on this. And one of the things he said last night was how impressed he was at the way they handle injuries. And there's no question. If it's a question mark, the guy doesn't come back in the game. And here's Ertz explaining how well the Jaden Daniels injury was handled. There's a lot of people, obviously, that want Jaden to be out there, obviously. Um, 
but people care about Jay and the person first. Um, and I think it's a testament to the people that they have running this place that they view us not only as employee number five or employee 86, uh, but they care about us as people, as individuals, and Jane's long-term health is of the utmost importance to everyone in this building. Um, and so they understand that Jaden's going to do everything he can to be out there. I think that everyone sees his com competitive spirit, how much he loves being out there with his guys. Um, and I, don't, I, I can't speak on whether he could have gone or could not have gone, but it was a no-brainer, I think, from the from the top down that he was done. Um, and I think it's a testament to the people they have running this And here's a different perspective. Uh, Terry McLaurin, again, has been here since 2019. Uh, he played under the uh, training of Ryan Vermillion who was brought in by Ron Rivera from Carolina. Ryan Vermillion had to cut a deal with the FBI so he wouldn't go to jail. <laughs> so, you know, if, if anybody knows uh, about the depths of despair in all phases of the organization, at least the last five years, now six years, it's Terry McLaurin. And uh, here were his thoughts on the way they handled it with Jaden. You just trust our coaches and the uh, medical staff to, you know, take care of us. They've been doing that. Uh, all year, so they're not going to put us in harm's way. And good thing about this this team, we got guys who are always ready for their opportunity and their moment. So, uh, like I said, um, you know, Jaden is one of our leaders on this team, and when you see him go down, that is that's tough for us. Um, but uh, Marcus did a great job coming in, and, and we had we sputtered a little bit, but we we started to click. And I think after that two minute drive, we were really rolling. So, um, yeah, just moving forward, uh, we're just going to continue to try to score touchdowns in the red zone, no matter who's back there at quarterback, no matter who's out there at receiver. I just think, like I said, I was trying to tell our guys, just we got to keep a, a, a standard of what we do, no matter who's out there and no matter what the score is. So at the end of the day, uh, we won you know, handily, and I think uh, we did a good job. Defense did an unbelievable job. Uh, Dante uh, Fowler came out and gave us a, 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 a spark right out the gate. Uh, had some agility and everything, and, and he got the pick, and then he scored. So that really got his jump started, and we knew we wanted to have a fast start uh, coming out today. He, he mentioned the standard, and uh, you'll hear at 10 o'clock what Dan Quinn says about that. But basically, they had some military people in over the summer, and they had to actually write out what the standard is. And, you know, the, the whitewashing of, of everything that went on here for, for years and years, it's, it's not completely over with. But I think with what you saw yesterday, with the way everybody embraced Daryl Green and the good feelings they had and a, a stadium full of people wearing burgundy jerseys for a change, not that the Carolina fan base travels all that well, but they did sell out. They had 63,000 people there. It looked like every seat was full. And, you know, just to see where this team is, Basically, two years after they were Carolina, I mean, the commanders were what the Carolina Panthers are now with an idiotic owner and David Tepper and a roster that stinks, uh, looks like a bust, though we, we don't know, you know, what's what's ultimately going to happen with their top draft picks. But, you know, Chase Chase Young turned out to be a bust. I mean, it was just one bad thing after another. And uh, what Tom Libero wrote in his column today, he was at the game yesterday, uh, and we'll talk a lot more about the Daryl Green retirement ceremony, but um, he writes today, this is Libero, it was a burial ceremony as well as a celebration, a burial of the poisonous past of former owner Dan Snyder and a celebration, not just a time before when players like Daryl Green and others led this team to Super Bowl championships, but also a celebration of the newfound savior, record-setting rookie quarterback Jaden Daniels, who has made the sunshine brighter, brighter than it has for this football team and its fans in a long, long time. Of course, he gets into you know Daniels getting knocked out of the game, but I, I like the way he put this, a burial ceremony of the poisonous past of Daniel Snyder, and I think that that sums up pretty well uh, the feeling yesterday that uh, this this is a good team, and and it's a team that can score a lot of points. The defense still has some holes in it, and it's hard to tell against the Carolina team that stinks. But you know, as you get further and further into the season, um, you know your goals and expectations change a little bit. Giants look like they're a mess right now. Eagles are on the rebound, maybe. Uh, the Cowboys appear to be a dumpster fire. And who knows? Who knows when you get to January what it's going to look like. So uh, coming up in the next hour, much more reaction to what happened yesterday at Northwest Stadium. Plus, I'll go over the great weekend for Daryl Green, who was honored properly with his number 28 retired. Stay with us. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. We have a saying at Passover. It's Dianu which means it would have been enough. 
it would have been enough if Daryl Green turned out to be a really good football player. It would have been enough if he made a couple of signature plays which put this team in the Super Bowl in 1988. It would have been enough if he played 20 years at corner. But he also became a pillar in the community. And the fact that 22 years after he retired, uh, finally he's back in the organization as he should be, uh, embraced with his number retired. And it just shows you where this team is uh, just two years after they were a complete dumpster fire. I mean, it's, it's really remarkable what the Josh Harris ownership group has been able to do in a short period of time. And they really haven't done anything that's you know, outside the box or, or, or genius move. They just ran, have run it properly. And, and just to think about the way this team was run for 24 years under Dan Snyder, my God, just, just awful. And, uh, and finally, we saw something over the weekend that should have happened a long time ago and couldn't happen because – rightfully so Daryl Green didn't want any part of Dan Snyder who did you know who who wanted that on their hands nobody he had people who worked for them oily people who carried out his his dirty deeds and uh and look at where they are now they're out of work he's you know Snyder's sitting on a pile of money I'll give him that but he lives in London he's not coming back here he's a pariah nobody wants him back here and, uh, and I think about Daryl Green, and, uh, and I got to know him. We did his radio show his last two years that he played his 19th and 20th season in the NFL. Just remarkable. And also the way that he has embraced this community. His wife is from here, so they weren't going to move. And uh, but here's how long it's been. Now, he played until he was 42. But it's now 22 years after that. And he'll be 65 in February. And if you've seen him, he looks like he could still put on a uniform. It's, it's crazy. But he's got 17 grandchildren with number 18 on the way. And uh, his son spoke at the Key to the City ceremony, which I was at on Saturday. And I'll have more details on that uh, coming up shortly. Brian Mitchell talked. Uh, Mitch Rails, one of the owners of the team, he was excellent talking about uh, Daryl Green. Daryl was, was excellent, talking about his, mostly about his family and friends. Uh, he spent some time on his career, but he also uh, talked rightfully so about the work that he's done in the community. And, you know, you think about people who have enveloped themselves in, in communities. I was in Dallas and saw how Roger Staubach was regarded there. Most of what he did was in business, but he was philanthropic as well. And, uh, and Daryl is, is much like him here in the way that he's revered by the fans and the way he's celebrated and the personality that he has. You know, Art Monk, when he went in the Hall of Fame, he and Daryl went in in the same year, 2008. I, uh, I broadcast that ceremony with Doc Walker. It was a great experience to be there that night. And I believe, at least at the time it was, and may, may not have been suppressed, uh, Art Monk got a four-minute standing ovation from the crowd. Uh, Daryl was cheered as well. But it was Art Monk that beloved. Art Monk doesn't have that personality. He he doesn't he doesn't like attention. He doesn't like to uh, get up in front of crowds. Didn't like to talk to reporters. So you know he wasn't that person. But Daryl is is that guy, and it was just perfect the way everything came together this weekend. The organization, top to bottom, did did a spectacular job with that. Uh, from the key to the city ceremony, I understand that they had a, a private reception with alumni. On Saturday night, they had um, a little bit of a rally before the game in the pavilion before the game, and then the halftime ceremony, which we didn't see on TV. You only saw if you were at the game. I'm going to play some of that coming up uh, in about 15 minutes or so. But uh, this was long overdue, and I just, you know, it's it's ridiculous that in the 20-plus years he's been retired – that he wasn't a part of the organization. He would be a great ambassador. I would even go so far as to say, I mean, I don't know if it would have happened, but I would go so far as to say that had he been a part of this team since he retired, we might have a stadium built in D.C. by now, or at least on the way to doing that. I mean, he, he had that kind of magnetic personality. If you saw the way he interacted with Mayor Muriel Bowser, if you saw any of that on TV or one of the uh, – thousand or so like me who were down uh, at Franklin Park Saturday, uh, they, they might have been able to work together uh, with the help of ownership, good ownership, not Dan Snyder, and uh, maybe we'd have a stadium at the RFK site. And uh, I, I don't think it's 
I, I, I still say that's, that's, that's a coin flip now. I think the, the ownership would like to have it. Obviously, a lot of fans would like to have it. It, it may not happen, uh, but I think it, it would have stood a better chance uh, if, if Daryl Green were involved. And maybe now that he is, that'll be helpful. Maybe he will have a job with the organization that will include something like that. I mean, I, I can't find a better ambassador for uh, Washington and for the football team than Daryl Green, and he got his his rightful honors over the weekend with uh, a variety of ceremonies. I'll get into uh, more of that. As for the team, and uh, this this also addresses the the complete changeover in the year plus of the, of the ownership. Now, remember, they didn't take over as owners until the end of July, like a week before training camp. So there, there was nothing they could do. You know, they 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 stayed with Ron Rivera, but began working behind the scenes. And as soon as the season was over, Rivera got the boot. Adam Peters comes in. Adam Peters hires Dan Quinn. Dan Quinn hires his staff. Adam Peters concentrates on the draft. And he concentrates on, and this is, this is very important, getting the right free agents here. You know, in the Snyder years, make a splash. Go after, oh, Brandon Ayuk is unhappy. Let's trade four draft picks there to get him and pay him whatever he wants. They didn't do any of that. They, 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 you know, even though Ayuk was was pretty public about wanting to come here and there was some social media stuff with Jaden Daniels, which may or may not have been so well advised, all those things. They, they, they brought in guys like Austin Eckler. Um, they, they, they brought in, uh, you know, Marcus Mariota, who obviously paid big dividends yesterday. Nick Allegretti, who's got three Super Bowl rings from playing in Kansas City. All those things uh, turned out to be very, very important here. And, you know, chemistry is a huge thing in football especially. And also setting the bar high. You know, Ron Rivera talked about how he changed the culture. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. The culture has clearly changed. And it changes in a large way because of the way Dan Quinn came in and immediately went to work on building a culture here. And players and coaches have talked about this. They had a little bit of a jump on everybody else with the new staff. They could start the offseason program a week early. And what he did in the first few days, he didn't do any football. He had the players get to know each other. And that way, he said, they would have each other's backs and they would root for each other. And that's clearly what happened here. And also, he established what he called the standard, as he explained after the game. We did create a standard as a team together, and that was from the players, and that began way back uh, in the spring, the week before the draft. And we put some things down on paper of who we wanted to be and how we wanted to do business together. We felt it was important to establish that before those 20, maybe it was 24, 25 rookies arrived to say, this is how we do things here at the Commanders. This is how we practice. This is the way you go. This is what you do for a walkthrough. And so having these guys get connected early, that was very important. So that's the standard. It's called the Commander Standard that they wrote together. And then expectation is just us um, constantly like searching for improvement. And uh, I think we're in week seven or in that space, and we – dug in just yesterday again to say we had some things that every player wanted to work on through the first seven weeks and into the next you know chapter is that going to be the same thing or something different so um, we love that we're trying to chase that hard to become better and it might be as a individual thing a small technique thing so um, Terry's right that we work really hard at that yeah Terry was the one uh, Terry McLaurin obviously mentioning that in the locker room it's it's a little bit different, but not all that different from the way Joe Gibbs used to do it. And Joe Gibbs had what he called a leadership council, and he had some key veteran players on it, both offense and defense. And when they would hit a bump, he would get them in a room and he would say, hey, this is your football team. You guys got to find a way to, to fix this. You're the leaders of this team. It's a different way of doing it, but it's it's the same concept. He's he's having the players write out what their standard is going to be. They they write the standard, and then he expects them to follow it. And uh, you get real clues as to how well that's going along. I don't know whether you because the game ended, you know, they they, they ran the ball down the Panthers' throats, and and Carolina wanted to get out of there as well, so they they were running time off the clock. But uh, the, the rushing number is the one that really stands out from yesterday. Two hundred and was it two hundred seven yards rushing? They had four hundred twenty one yards of total offense. Um, so you know the the way they were able to uh, run it down their throats was big, and you know having having Brian Robinson back 
was big as well. Uh, Robinson with 71 yards and a touchdown in this game. Here's more from Quinn. You just feel his strength, you know, and the pile moves forward. And um, it was the right call to hold him last week. It wasn't the easiest call. It was the more difficult right over the easier wrong, you know, because he wanted to go, but he wasn't himself in terms of what he could do. And so I felt early on in practice, even though it was hard not to have him last week, it was the right decision. And uh, it was great to have him back out there today and get him back into the, his space and, and going. It was it was really important. For yeah, us. and so the long-winded way of I'm talking about this with the running game and running down the clock, there was a lot of time after the game. That's the point I want to get to. And so CBS had time to fill, and they aired an interview with sideline reporter Evan Washburn talking to Marcus Mariota about being able to step in as he did yesterday, throwing for a couple hundred yards, no interceptions, two touchdowns, and just just being able to take the reins. And what you'll hear here from Mariota, I think, is really significant. And it was pointed out by the by the uh, the set crew uh, led by James Brown um, after after this interview aired. This was uh, Evan Washburn, sideline reporter with uh, Marcus Mariota. When Jaden goes down, it's a 10 nothing game. What's going through your mind? Uh, first and foremost, just him. You know, he's an unbelievable kid, and you just think about the player and the person. Um, and then, really, it's football. But you just think about him and making sure he's good. How were you able to be so effective? Oh, these guys are unbelievable. Uh, we got an awesome group of guys that just believe in each other. And, um, you know, they may play after play. I just did my best to give them a chance. What's going on with this team right now? What are you guys building on both sides, you think? Uh, it's a brotherhood. We talk about it all the time. Um, honestly, it's, it's the best place to work. And uh, I, I enjoy going in with these guys. It's a lot of fun. And um, when you have a brotherhood like this, you'll find ways to win. We saw Jaden come back out. He just walked by. He looks to be in good spirits. Are you planning on starting next Sunday, or are you thinking you're going to be backing him up? I have, I have no idea, but if I had to, if I had to guess, the kid's unbelievably tough. Um, but if they need me, I'll do my best. Best place to work. How long has it been since you heard that? And Mariota has been with some decent organizations. He was drafted by Tennessee. Uh, he played with Philadelphia last year. Um, that's been a, a pretty good organization recently. Played with the Atlanta Falcons. Actually started 12 games for them. Uh, was, was pretty decent doing that. Uh, but he said this is the best place to work. And when they got to the news conference, uh, he kind of reiterated that in, in talking about why this, this stop for him seems to be such a special one. It comes down to guys just enjoy being around each other. Um, guys hang out in the locker room. Guys are enjoying... Uh, going to work, um, you know, it's a it's a tough sport we play. Um, there's a lot of pressures day in and day out. Um, but I think we have such a good core group of guys that understand that. And when you step in the building, man, it's just it's enjoyable. It's fun. And when you have that type of atmosphere, everyone is just kind of going in the same direction. Um, it, it's it's really cool to be a part of and, and an echo on that. And I think this perspective is very important. Nick Allegretti, before he came to Washington, has been with the gold standard of football in the last, you know, 10, 15 years. It, it's the Kansas City Chiefs. The Kansas City Chiefs won three of the last four Super Bowls. Okay? So he is he's seen it. He's seen how well it runs with Andy Reid as the coach, and it, it certainly helps to have a talent like Patrick Mahomes. But also, you know, he's he's got the perspective of coming there, coming from there to here, which had been just an absolute mess even in, even last season with new ownership. And this is, I think, really important to listen to. This is, And I think he's one of the smartest guys on the team. Offensive linemen generally are. But uh, Nick Allegretti uh, really is, is uh, eloquent in the things that he said. And here he is after the game uh, talking about why it's so great to be playing in Washington. You know, a lot of guys come from winning organizations and they come in, well, this is the way we used to do it over there and they ought to do it over here. This, No, no, he's saying he's coming from the best of the best in the NFL, <laughs> a dynasty. And here he's walking in the door here and these are his observations. Nick Allegretti. And it's, it's a lot of fun. I'll say that. I mean, putting that many points up is, is fun. Uh, it's hard to score. It's hard to win in this league. So being able to do it by putting up a lot of points is, is a blast. And, not going to put a limit on. I mean, we, as as we said, continue to get better. You see the connections, uh, you know, with Jaden and Marcus and, and you know the receivers, tight ends, running backs, getting better every week. Communication on the O line is getting 
awesome. It, it's really cool. It's a really cool group to play with. Um, not just the guys next to you, but you know Sam and Wiley communicating to the to the left side. You know what they're seeing. Um, Ty and you know Dieter doing an incredible job at center. So not going to put a limit on it, but excited to see you know how we continue to progress. You guys are five and two. You know what a winning feeling is like. The winning momentum. Yeah. Why do you think this team is playing the way they are right now? I don't know. There's a there's a lot of hunger in the locker room. Uh, you know, it, it's a, a new locker room. Obviously, built up of guys from all over the league and. You know, the guys that were here in the past, I mean, obviously their their hunger's obvious. You know, they they there's a lot of pain in them from the prior years, and they have no desire to go back uh, to anything like that. So they're they're playing their you know their balls off. Or, sorry, um, but they are. Um, and then you know a lot of guys you know coming from all over. You know, personally myself, first opportunity to get a, a chance to be the be the one for the you know beginning of the season and forward and. Just trying to take advantage of the opportunity. I love it. Getting the, getting a chance to be that guy is awesome. Um, yeah, I know it's exciting. There's the energy in this locker room is awesome. The guys love showing up to work. DQ and AP create a great environment for us at work, so it's it's comfortable um, while still you know working you know, as hard as we can every day. So I I, I love it. The first seven weeks have been a blast. <laughs> Nick Allegretti, you know, I mean, what better endorsement than that? Somebody who comes from a, a three-time Super Bowl champion, back-to-back winners. Uh, if they win this year, it's the greatest dynasty of all time in the Super Bowl era. Packers did win three straight, including the one they won before the two Super Bowls. But, I mean, you just don't hear that. And I think that's that's a significant endorsement of what's going on here. Because yeah, now they've had some, some free agents here in the past uh, and some really bad ones like Dana Stubblefield, who's now in jail for rape. Uh, but he came to Washington and supposedly was was showing the coaches the playbook from San Francisco and said they ought to run it there. And if you listen to what Allegretti said, uh, I think that's that's really significant when he talked about the free agents that they brought in. Remember, anybody who comes to Washington was thrown out by another team. You know, they had the opportunity to re-sign them and didn't do it. So all the guys that he brought in here had all been looked at by the previous team and said, no, nah, we're not going to pay what it takes to keep them. And they didn't spend big money on anybody. There's nobody here on big I guess, you know, for a quarterback like uh, like Mariota, you, you have to pay the going rate. Maybe it's $10 million. I don't think any of these other guys got salaries like that. Not And, you know, that's that's really how you build culture. And, and Allegretti also talked about uh, the guys who have been here. They turned over half the roster, but the ones who stayed – they're talking about how things are so much better now. And that's really what you had to do. You had to, the, the owners here are spending money. They're doing things the right way. They're bringing in the right people. And I mean, I, I've spent a career chronicling the mess. I, I started doing sports radio in Washington in 1992, which was after the last Super Bowl. And there was still some momentum left. Joe Gibbs did make the playoffs his last year, but then the horrible Richie Pettibone year came. Richie was a great guy, but the team was terrible. Uh, the Norv Turner years, and then all the dysfunction under Dan Snyder and the, and the reaches like Steve Spurrier and the, and the ridiculous hire like Jim Zorn, all that stuff went through all that. And now here's the guy who's coming from the top of the mountain, the Kansas City Chiefs, and saying, man, this is really, this is top-notch. People love playing here. This is great. This is fun. Now, maybe that's part of a, a job of a leader, too, you know, is, is to tell people in and outside the organization that this is the right thing to do. I, and I understand that. But I don't think he'd be making that up. That That's really so refreshing. Uh, coming up, we'll get to some of the festivities around the Daryl Green retirement of, of his number. He retired a long time ago, but the retirement of 28 and uh, how well that was handled as well. Uh, I was at the uh, Key to the City ceremony on Saturday, and I do have audio from the halftime, which was not on TV, uh, when Daryl Green's number was officially retired and what he said to the adoring crowd. Stay with us. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. 49 years ago today, Carlton Fisk, with a 12th inning home run, sent the World Series to Game 7, and in the minds of many, uh, may have been a big boost to baseball, which was teetering at that point. Now, the ratings a lot different than they are now, but uh, baseball was getting ready to be overtaken by football. Believe it or not, 
There was a time when baseball was bigger than football. Now it's, you know, it's dwarfed by football. But uh, but this was a huge, huge moment for baseball, even though it happened after midnight, but uh, is remembered fondly uh, by anybody who saw it. In fact, it's, it's even referenced in Goodwill Hunt, Hunting, the Robin Williams character, talking about how he gladly gave up tickets to that game because he was with his uh, wife-to-be and uh, talked about love and things like that. So, you know, not to get too sappy about it, but it was, uh, it was a pretty... Pretty cool moment, and uh, I'll get to that uh, coming up. The uh, the retirement of Daryl Green's number twenty eight, and uh, I was I was at the key to the city ceremony, which took place in Franklin Park on Saturday morning. They had it looked like over a thousand people there, maybe more. Uh, many of them related to Daryl, who's from a, a large family himself, so he had brothers and sisters there, and uh, and an aunt was there, an elderly aunt, and Daryl has four kids. He's about to become a grandfather of 18, 17 grandchildren. And they were all there, and he he was, you know, reveling in, in showing them off as he should have. I mean, it was a really very warm and, and, and wonderful day, um, you know, beautiful day, gorgeous day uh, in October, and also a, a really well-done ceremony, which this, this organization has never really done well in the past. I mean, you know, just one example, the Sean Taylor uh, Dick's Sporting Goods mannequin that they rolled out a couple of years ago. They already removed that from the stadium, all that mess that took place. Uh, under Snyder and especially as he was trying to save his his butt from being forced out which finally they did um they they do things right and Mitch Rails the uh I guess he's second in ownership uh he's got a, a large investment the the biggest investment of course is Josh Harris but he invested quite a bit of money in the team as well and I didn't think he would be a public face because uh, I worked for him many years ago he and his brother started sports radio I knew them when they were younger men and uh, they didn't like people to know their business they were not public people but Mitch seems quite comfortable doing this and he told the story of Daryl Green uh, with the with the Redskins, Mitch is a couple years older than I am, so he remembers all of his career as well. And he talked about, uh, in specifically, the week, the the back to back weeks where uh, Daryl returned a punt against the uh, Chicago Bears, and uh, that put them in the NFC Championship game where they played the Vikings, and he knocked the ball away from Darren Nelson at the goal line to preserve the victory. I, I don't think I've ever thought of it in these terms, and maybe you haven't as well. But he's he's gotten to know Doug Williams well. Doug Williams is with the organization, so he sees him quite a bit. And he said that Daryl basically set things up so Doug Williams could become the first African-American quarterback to play in a Super Bowl and win a Super Bowl. Daryl doesn't make those two plays. Maybe it doesn't happen. Um, the other thing I would fill in the blanks on is when he hurdled Cap Boso in the Chicago game to, to bring the punt back, uh, if you've seen the the uh, the video of this, he's grabbing his rib as he's running for a touchdown, and it turned out he tore a rib cage muscle uh, and was not going to play in the championship game the following week. And Richie Pettibone, who had played, he was defensive coordinator, had played in the '60s and the '70s, said, uh, "We really need you to take the shot." And in Richie's day, there was no question: you took the shot, you played. Daryl didn't want to do it. He was in his fifth year; he'd never taken an injection before, but finally he agreed to do it. And he said that the injection wore off in the first quarter. So when he knocked the ball away, he was in quite a bit of pain. But it was a, a great play, and it sent the, uh, the then Redskins to the Super Bowl. Um, this was Muriel Bowser, the mayor, and uh, recognizing Daryl not just for his great football uh, skills and, and the, the football contributions that he made, but the things he's done in the community. He's been involved here ever since he got here in 1983. He's helped with his foundation for education, for kids. They're, they're very invested in, in the community. Uh, his wife is from here. So, you know, Daryl's talked about this a million times that uh, he went to Tyson's Corner Mall on Christmas Eve in 1983 with his teammate Vernon Dean, who was his, his backfield mate. Uh, Vernon played corner as well. And uh, he met... He met Jewel, and one thing led to another, and now all these years later with 17 grandchildren and four kids, uh, they, are, they are really one of, the, one of the premier couples of Washington, D.C., and, uh, and this was Muriel Bowser with her appreciation as she presented him with the key to the city on Saturday. Daryl is a hero to Washington, and as I told him yesterday, I don't know if he's adopted us, but we have adopted him as an honorary Washingtonian. 
and he gets it and he gets us. And part of the reason why he gets us is the real MVP of the Green family, Mrs. Jewel Green. Thank you, Jewel. You may not know this, but she is our home girl from Petworth. And I got a funny feeling that that's the reason that the Green family never left us. Jewel Green. Daryl played for 20 years in Washington, D.C. And there are not too many people that can say they've had an NFL career that long. And longtime Washingtonians like me and you and a whole bunch of us Remember those days where Daryl Green uh, thrilled us from day one. We know that he was the four-time NFL fastest man. We already knew he was going to chase down his opponents. We love to watch the interception. We love to watch our team in the Super Bowl. We love to be, you know where, at RFK. Here she's milking it a little bit because obviously she wants the team to come back to RFK. She even looked over at Mitch Rails at one point here. She's milking this. This is Mario Bowser. Yeah. So you know me. I like to give the people what they want. Yeah, I understand that. Um, we'll see if that happens. It's, uh, I think as time goes on, uh, the chances are, are decreasing, and uh, I, I would love to see the stadium built on the RFK site. I just, uh, I just don't know whether that's going to happen. Anyway, that was on Saturday, and then Daryl gave a really nice speech, really heartfelt speech about uh, how the community embraced him and how he's been able to, uh, to be a big part of it for all these years. And, and again, I just as I'm watching this, I'm thinking, what a shame that we didn't have this for 20 years after he finished playing. He should have been, he should have segued right into this. Should have had a front office job with the team, been a great ambassador for the team. But there was a lot of issues with Dan Snyder, as there were with most people. And some of that goes back to, and this, I remember this. I was doing a, a television show uh, with Irving Fryer, who was then playing for the Redskins, and Mark Carrier. This was the year of 2000 when they were going for it. And um, talking to him off the air, Dan Snyder had a meeting. This was Snyder's second year as the owner. He had a meeting of what he considered to be the leaders on the team in his office and Daryl Green was not invited. So the bad blood started very early on. And, you know, after he retired, he wasn't going to, you know, he wasn't going to say anything bad about Snyder, but it was pretty clear that he, he didn't like the way he did business. And, and Snyder looked at him as, you know, something he inherited, not something he signed. He was m more proud of his shiny toys when he brought in people like Bruce Smith and Deion Sanders, who wound up staying one year, uh, and others. That, that was... That was what he liked. He didn't like the guys who had built this organization and uh, built up the, the greatness of this organization like Daryl Green. Uh, this is now understood by current ownership, and they did an excellent job of, uh, of all of this. They, uh, they had a, I understand they had a, a private uh, a group on Saturday night. They brought in a lot of alumni for this. I saw some of them uh, at this. I saw Ray Brown there. I saw Raleigh McKenzie um, I saw Monty Coleman, and uh, this is this is the I guess the ravages of football. Uh, Monty Coleman was known as Superman when he played. He played 16 years for the team. I think he's the only guy that spanned um, spanned the era of um, of uh, of uh, who was it? it? He he started here in 1979, so he was like an 11th round draft. Jack Party was the coach. I think he's the only one that spanned Jack Party and Norv Turner. He had, did he was here for the whole. Uh, Joe Gibbs first go round and then did a year under um, under North Turner, um, and he's in a wheelchair now. And I don't know, uh, you know, what the issue is, but uh, just you know, you feel bad about that. He's a year older than I am, and uh, you know, you you wouldn't think of somebody that big and that strong uh, and as as incredible shape that he was in that has come to that. But football football's a rough deal. Uh, Green though looks looks great, keeps himself in great shape, and he played twenty years in the NFL, so. You know things affect people differently, but uh, this was this was at halftime 
of yesterday's game. Uh, the halftime in the NFL is is 12 minutes. They were given permission to go a little bit longer. And uh, Daryl's speech was was uh, short and to the point. I'm going to play the whole thing here. Uh, and it's with the introduction by Josh Harris, whose organization finally made this happen as uh, Daryl Green's number 28 is now flying in the stadium along with the other retired numbers, which are 33 for um, Sammy Ball, which was retired a long time ago. Bobby Mitchell's 49, which was retired during the, the height of what was going on with George Floyd. Uh, not that his number doesn't deserve to be retired, but I think that was that was somewhat using the fact that he was the first African-American player uh, the time of uh, Dan Snyder on the team to try and, you know, spackle things over. Uh, that that was that. Uh, Sonny Jurgensen's number was retired two years ago, rightfully so, number nine, and now number 28. Still some to go. Uh, the late Charlie Taylor, 42. I imagine John Riggins will have his number retired at some point, maybe sometime soon. Art Monk, 81. Uh, and maybe Larry Brown, uh, even though he's not a Hall of Famer, there's there's numbers that still have to go up there. But this was uh, this was at halftime, and uh, Josh Harris and I think Daryl Green hitting all the right notes. Hey Daryl, thank you for all the magic moments and everything you've done for our community, both on the field and off the field. We should have done this a long time ago. We should have done this a long time ago. It's time to retire number 28. Let's do it. Let's raise that flag and get. let's get rid of that number forever. Thank you, man, for everything. We love you. Thank you, Josh. Thank all of you. Thank my family. I got all of these people over the last 41 years, and God has been good, and they joined with all of you as my family. I'm grateful to God that he chose me to come to this community, (laughs) to be a part of you. I am so grateful to be, or should I say, to have the privilege of carrying the type of influence, managing the type of resources, and having the type of access to people that I can take all of this and support them with. It means a lot to me. The game was fun. It was a kid's game. I played it as such and my results were good. (laughs) So as I close, I'm closing now. I want to say what I said earlier today. All of you who are the Gen Zers, who don't know about these, at least the back end, who don't know about these who are the alpha generation, This man is committed to bringing it back, but we can't bring it back without you. And so, I just want to encourage everybody because the franchise is so important to our community, to all of our community. But the community is you. The success rides with you and the guys in that locker room. You back them up, they'll do what we did. And last but not least, to all of my teammates, all of y'all, you guys helped me to stand out here today. God bless each one of you. God bless you fans. God bless our players, our ownership. And let's go, Commander! All right. That was Daryl Green yesterday. And uh, Barry Zerluga, who covered this for the Post, he's been in town about 20 years. And uh, he wrote these couple of paragraphs, which I think are, are a good follow-up to that. He said, in this radically different day and age, 
Words such as those from a franchise icon don't seem like pathetic pleas to reel in an alienated fan base back into the fold. They seemed absolutely reasonable, easy to be fo- easy to follow. To be clear, Jaden Daniels is the locomotive who pulls this train, and any chance he's out for a significant time would put the loftiest possibilities in jeopardy. Yeah, veteran Marcus Mariota acquitted himself well and made offensive coordinator Cliff Kingsbury look even more handsome by the week by completing 18 of his 23 throws for 205 yards and two touchdowns and polishing off the route. But Green's number retirement ceremony and the ensuing blowout served as the latest reminder of the difference between what was and what is and i read earlier what tom lavero said and i think this is uh this is a good way to describe this as well he said it was a burial ceremony as well as a celebration a burial of the poisonous past of former owner dan snyder and a celebration not just at a time before when players like green and others led this team to super bowl championships but also a celebration of the newfound savior record-setting rookie quarterback Jaden daniels who has made the sunshine brighter than it has for this football team and its fans in a long, long time. So um, that's the kind of weekend it was. Uh, I was happy to be a part of it on Saturday and uh, to be able to watch the YouTube from the halftime of yesterday was great. I hope you enjoyed uh, that. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, everything they are doing is is in the right direction. Is it going to pay off with a championship? We'll see. We'll see. But they had to clean up so much of the toxic atmosphere that still existed and to have done it in a really relatively short period of time because they didn't really have the time to do this last year they had to kind of ride with what was in place they weren't going to fire ron rivera during the season that never does any good but they had to you know spend time getting their ducks in a row seeing where they were with the organization seeing how bad the stadium was to dump 75 million dollars into making it at least presentable right now and to see sixty three thousand people there wearing mostly burgundy and a lot of them wearing number 28 was really a cool thing and it was just two years ago then that wouldn't have happened even if i i don't think i don't think daryl would have agreed to have his number retired under the dan snyder ownership but if he did it wouldn't have been anything like this and uh you know it's great to see it's it's uh i have to if, if I sound a little bit too positive, well, maybe I'm making up for the last 25 years because things just are so much, so much better now. That'll do it for me. Bram is coming up next, and I'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.